Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding VNA's Distance Default Measurements. In this presentation, we'll explain how vector network analyzers can be used to determine the location and magnitude of faults in coaxial cables. This presentation assumes a very basic understanding of VISWAR and return loss. If you're unfamiliar with these topics, or if you'd like a brief review, you may want to watch the presentation, Understanding VISWAR and Return Loss, before beginning this presentation. We'll start with an overview of coaxial cables. Coaxial or coax cables consist of an inner conductor, a conducting outer shield or sheath, and an insulator or dielectric between these conductors. The sizes, spacing, and composition of these components determine the electrical properties of the cable, the most important being the cable's so-called characteristic impedance which is almost always either 50 ohms or, less often, 75 ohms. Other properties include its attenuation or loss per unit length and its velocity factor, which expresses the speed at which the signals travel through the cable as a fraction of the speed of light. When radio frequency signals are conducted over long distances, both indoors and outdoors, this is most often done using coaxial cables. These cables are, however, a common point of failure within radio frequency systems. Problems may occur suddenly or gradually over time, and the severity of the problems can range from complete system failure to various levels of performance degradation. In a non-laboratory environment, problems may be caused by environmental factors, such as water, temperature changes, lightning, etc., or mechanical damage, such as kinks, cuts, or excessive bends. Installation or materials issues are another common cause of cable problems. All of these problems, or faults, have one common characteristic. They change the impedance along the cable. Anything which changes the spacing between the center and shield, or the dielectric between them, will change the cable's impedance at that point. And these impedance changes cause signal reflections at the points where these changes occur. These reflections can therefore be used to detect cable faults. This is done using an instrument called a Vector Network Analyzer, or VNA, and since this measurement is often made in the field, portable-slash-battery-powered VNAs are most commonly used. A signal is injected into a terminated cable under test, and the resulting reflections are measured and analyzed in order to determine both the distance to, as well as the magnitude of, any faults along the cable. These faults are then displayed in terms of return loss or voltage standing wave ratio as a function of distance, and therefore this measurement is referred to as distance to fault. As mentioned earlier, distance to fault is primarily used for longer cables, often outdoors, such as the feeder cable of a tower-mounted antenna. DTF can determine both the presence and approximate location of a fault, that is, it minimizes the section of cable that needs to be manually checked or replaced. Repeatability of the measurement is often more important than extremely high accuracy, which is difficult to achieve in practice. For example, we often want to compare a current measurement to a known good or baseline trace. In the remainder of this presentation, we'll go through the technical details and procedures used in making distance default measurements. Distance default can be implemented using time domain reflectometry, or TDR, and it can be implemented using frequency domain reflectometry, or FDR. Let's start by spending a couple of minutes explaining each of these two methodologies. Time domain reflectometry is the traditional method used in DTF. In TDR, a pulse or other short duration signal is transmitted into the cable. When this pulse encounters a short, an open, or a large impedance mismatch, some portion of this pulse's energy will be reflected. If multiple faults are present, this will cause multiple reflections. In TDR, faults are detected and measured entirely in the time domain by observing the time delay between when the pulse was transmitted and when one or more reflections are received. One drawback of TDR is that, generally speaking, it can detect shorts and opens, but often cannot reliably detect smaller faults. 
Most modern DTF implementations therefore use something called frequency domain reflectometry. Instead of sending in a single pulse, FDR uses a swept frequency RF signal. The reflections are measured in the frequency domain, and then an inverse FFT, or fast Fourier transform, is performed on the reflected signals to convert this frequency domain measurement into a time domain measurement, with the results showing return loss or visoire as a function of time. Because FDR measures both magnitude and phase, it's more sensitive than TDR and can detect many faults which TDR could not. Historically, TDR was less expensive to implement than FDR, but this has changed over the last several decades, and FDR is now the standard way of implementing distance default measurements in portable or field-use VNAs. There are five basic steps in configuring distance default measurements on a VNA. These are verifying cable terminations, connecting the cable to the analyzer, configuring the cable parameters, defining the sweep frequency range, and performing a calibration. Let's go through each of these configuration steps, starting with the cable termination. The far end of a cable and distance default measurements should be terminated whenever possible. This prevents the unwanted reflections that would be caused by an open at the end of the cable, and it also improves measurement accuracy. This termination can be either a resistive 50 ohm load or dummy load, or it can be a well-matched antenna that absorbs and radiates most of the power it receives over the test frequency range. Although DTF is often performed on cables connected to tower-mounted antennas, a 50 ohm load is always preferable for several reasons. First and foremost, a resistive load will not change its impedance when the test frequency is swept. In addition, the termination minimizes the possibility of over-the-air signals being picked up by the antenna and entering the cable, which can make accurate measurements difficult or impossible. And finally, a termination will also prevent the DTF test signal from being radiated by the antenna, potentially creating interference to other nearby spectrum users. When making DTF measurements, the near end of the cable under test may be directly connected to the analyzer output port. However, in many cases, the cable is connected to the VNA by means of a so-called DUT, or device under test cable. This is usually a high-quality, phase-stable cable with a length on the order of about one meter. Using a DUT cable can be helpful when the near end of the cable is difficult to access, and it can also help reduce strain on the instrument connector. As we'll see in a few moments, a process called calibration can be used to remove the effects of this DUT cable from the measurement results. Accurate DTF measurement also requires the specification of the cable model. This model describes two characteristics of the cable under test. The first is the cable's velocity factor, which is simply the speed of signals within the cable expressed as a fraction of the speed of light. Often this is in the range of about 0.65 to 0.85. Velocity factor is used to convert time into length. The second is the cable's attenuation, expressed in units of dB per meter, or foot, and this attenuation is also a function of frequency. The attenuation value is needed so that cable attenuation can be taken into account when calculating the magnitude of faults. In most cases, both of these values are entered by indicating the cable type, which is commonly printed directly on the cable sheath itself. Note, however, that if incorrect values or the wrong cable model is entered, accuracy may be very poor. Attenuation errors increase linearly as cable distance increases, and errors in velocity factor cause the distance results to be scaled incorrectly by the amount of error. Many analyzers have predefined cable models for the most common cable types, and all analyzers allow for manual specification of both velocity factor and attenuation when needed. Next, let's talk about frequency range. Recall that in FDR, the analyzer sweeps the test signal over a user-definable frequency range, often called the span, or sometimes the bandwidth, and this span is centered around a user-defined frequency. Increasing the frequency span causes two things to happen. 
First, the maximum measurable distance, or maximum cable length, is reduced. But increasing the span also improves the detail, or resolution, of the results. That is, a larger frequency span improves the ability to differentiate between, or to resolve, two closely spaced faults. Let's look at an example. If our cable under test were approximately 90 meters long, common DTF parameters and a span of 100 megahertz would yield a maximum measurement distance of 200 meters. A span of 200 megahertz would correspond to 100 meters, and a span of 500 megahertz would have a maximum measurable distance of only 40 meters. Although either 100 or 200 megahertz would provide enough distance, 200 megahertz would be the better choice since it provides better resolution. Note too that the frequency range and center frequency must be chosen to cover the intended frequencies of operation for the cable under test. Let's look at this again mathematically. The maximum distance in meters can be calculated from the selected span, the cable's velocity factor, the configured number of measurement or trace points, and the speed of light. As can be seen from the equation, we can increase maximum distance either by decreasing the frequency span or by increasing the number of measurement points, n. But note that increasing the number of measurement points will also increase the time needed to make a measurement. Resolution, also in meters, is essentially the distance between trace points and is also calculated using velocity factor and span. In general, smaller values of resolution are more desirable, since this provides greater detail and the ability to distinguish between closely spaced faults. When configuring DTF measurements on a VNA, it's often possible to enter a maximum cable length and then have the VNA automatically determine an appropriate frequency span. In addition to configuring span and the number of measurement points, a one-port calibration is also necessary for accurate DTF measurements. The calibration process involves sequentially attaching an open, a short, and a match or load to the location where the cable under test will be connected. These standards can be in the form of discrete standards or may be combined into a calibration T. In addition to these manually attached standards, electronic calibration units can also be used. These units switch their internal standards in and out automatically and are controlled by the attached VNA. Regardless of which type of calibration standard is used, this is usually a follow the prompts process in which the VNA will indicate which standards are to be connected in which order and at which times. The entire process generally takes only a few minutes with automatic calibration units tending to be much faster than using manual standards. Note that if the cable under test will be directly connected to the analyzer port, the calibration standards should also be attached directly to this port. If, on the other hand, a DUT cable is used, then the calibration standards should be attached to the end of the DUT cable. Doing this moves the so-called calibration plane to the end of the DUT cable and thus removes the DUT cable from the measurement results. After configuring settings and performing calibration, Measurement results are normally automatically displayed when the cable under test is attached. Results are most often shown in the form of return loss or visoir as a function of distance, and peaks in the plot correspond to faults. Since return loss is logarithmic, that is, in units of dB, return loss is often a better choice than linear visoir values when looking at a wide range of fault magnitudes. But in both cases, greater values indicate higher reflections or worse faults. Many analyzers allow a threshold to be set for defining what constitutes a fault. Note too that in some cases, the magnitude of a fault can provide some indication or hint as to the nature of the fault. Let's end with a brief summary. Distance to fault measurements are used to detect and localize faults in coaxial cables most often for longer cables and or for cables used in outdoor or other harsh environments. These faults create impedance mismatches, which will reflect transmitted signals back towards the source. Vector network analyzers, or VNAs, are therefore used to measure distance to fault,
since they can inject a swept frequency signal into the cable and then perform an inverse fast Fourier transform on the received reflections and convert this information into the time domain. The sweep range affects both the maximum measurable distance as well as the resolution within that measured distance. As with most other VNA measurements, proper calibration is needed to achieve accurate results. And this calibration can also remove the effect of any DUT cable used to connect the VNA to the cable under test. And finally, DTF measurement results are given in the form of return loss, or visoir, as a function of distance, with higher peaks indicating more serious faults. This concludes our presentation, Understanding VNA's Distance Default Measurements. If you'd like to learn more about distance default testing or vector network analyzers, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.